Welcome to the Healthy Human Revolution podcast. I'm Dr. Lori Marvis, and today we are so honored to have Dr. Ruth Heydrich. How are you today, ma'am? I am doing fantastic. Well, you look fantastic, and I can't wait to share your story. So you, first of all, are an amazing human, but you, you actually faced a very devastating diagnosis, and I'd like you to share us, you know, with us your story how old you are, what happened, and just tell us about Ruth, or Dr. Ruth, I should say. Okay. Well, let me go back to 1968, when I was 33 years old, and uh, I had, was working on my PhD at the time. I'd already gotten a bachelor's and a master's, and uh, thought, really, life is going very well. And I had a job with the Air Force and I was going on a trip. So I was looking for something to read. And on this newsstand, I saw a book called Aerobics. I had never seen that word before. No wonder because Dr. Kenneth Cooper had just coined that word. And he was publishing the research that he had done with the Air Force recruits coming in to, for the Vietnam War. And he had, his job as a medical doctor was to get them into shape, fighting shape. So he tried different exercises and found that running was the best cardiovascular exercise to get people the fittest in the shortest amount of time. So reading that book, I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to start running. And so that's what got me started. And the first time I went out, I went... Uh, half a mile down the street, turned around, came back. I know it was half a mile because I measured it on the car's odometer and I thought, oh, I've run a mile. And I went to work that morning and I'm telling everybody, oh, this is such a fun exercise. I had so much energy and thought this is the answer and started extending because I'd get to that turnaround point, not wanting to turn around. <laughs> I'd go a little further, a little further, a little further. And one day, somebody said, you know, they have a race here on base. You ought to enter it. And I thought, oh, why not? So I entered it. And then I got to thinking, oh, oh you know, I've got to, I don't want to be last. I got to make sure I finish. And, and so I started training a little harder. So I get to the race venue and I look at, it's a small base, Hickam Air Force Base. I look around. I'm the only female. And I'm thinking, <laughs> Oh, what if I can't finish? And these men are all going to say, oh, see, we told you. And I was about ready to leave, and the gun fires. <laughs> and so I have no choice, and I start running, and I run like mad, and I, and I finish. And I thought, oh, thank goodness I finished it. And I wasn't last either. <laughs> oh, great. And then I hear my name. <laughs> and so I get called up to the stand, and I get handed a first place gold medal. And I thought, Oh, this is incredible. <laughs> launched my running career. Wow. I had been running 13 years, 14 years, and had really thought that I was the healthiest person I knew, the fittest for sure, because not many other people were running back in the late 60s and early 70s. I had also had a course in university on nutrition. So I had been told how you need lots of protein and the best sources are lean, like chicken and fish, and you need low-fat dairy. And so I was using carnation instant powdered milk as my source of calcium mm. and thought, I am really healthy. Well, one day I was down at the beach in my bikini top and I leaned over and someone pointed at me and said, Ruthie, you've got a lump in your breast. And I looked down, here was this thing like that, the size of a golf ball. Hmm. Where, where did this come from? So I immediately got into the, you know, the base has their medical facility right there. And they looked at it, referred me immediately to Tripler. And uh, the, the doctor looked at me one look and he said, why did you wait so long to come in? And I said, I've been having my mammograms and my exams. And he said, never mind, get up, 
he said, we've got to get a biopsy right away. He marched me right down, get this lady in for an excisional biopsy, which, you know, means they, the excisional means they go in, take the whole thing out instead of just a little tiny bit. So I thought, this can't be. I'm running marathons. By this time, I'd run a bunch of them, running every day, thinking I'm so healthy. And so I couldn't believe it. I kept thinking, this, this can't be. It's a mistake. So I told the surgeon, I want to watch this surgery. And he said, oh, no, no, you don't want to watch. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to watch. Give me a local, and I want to see what that thing is. So they finally agreed. They let me watch, and I'm watching him cut, 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 pulls this thing that's this, this big out, puts it on this little table, takes a scalpel and cuts it in half, and, and he says, uh-oh. And I said, what do you mean? Oh, he'd forgotten I was awake. And mm. he said, oh, well, um, cleared his throat, swallowed hard, and said, you see these little grains of sand? That's your body's effort at walling off calcifications. And uh, that's, that's not a good sign. But he said, we don't know yet. We're going to send this down to pathology and do a frozen section. So he said, go ahead and get dressed and uh, see me in my office. So I walk back, get dressed, and then back to the office. And I see him, and he's facing the window and it's on the telephone. And he's saying, it's infiltrating ductal carcinoma. And I knew what carcinoma meant. And I, thought, mm. and I was... I was so devastated and I'm thinking I've been betrayed not only by my body but by everything I was taught everything I did running up, and I, I I really fell apart hmm. um, I was so anxious and full of anxiety and, and frustration and anger and then I thought how can I to save my life I can't get mad at these doctors who didn't find this soon enough with my mammograms. By the way, I'd had about five years of negative mammograms. So it mm. never picked up. And the reason was because of my high animal diet, my breasts were very dense. And mm. so actually when I was right after the diagnosis, I uh, told the nurse, I want to talk to the, the people that interpret mammograms. I want them to pull it up and I'm going to point to right where that cancer was. And, and I'm going to say, you tell me you can't see that cancer there. It's so big. Well, mm. I did that. And he said, look, you can't see it. There's all this dense breast tissue there. So I lost my faith in mammograms too, <laughs> everything. Right. So I'm thinking, woe is me. I'm going to die. And, and because I was on medical leave, I had time to read the paper and I was trying to distract myself thinking, what am I going to do? It takes a while to be transferred from sur the surgical department to the oncology department. So I had a week in between. The next morning, I'm reading the paper, just trying to keep my mind from going insane. The notice, little notice in the paper says, wanted women with breast cancer to participate in diet research study. Diet. Oh, yeah, I know all about diet and research. I want to find out why I got this cancer. It's called Dr. McDougall. And that's all it said. And the phone number. And it was a Kailua number. I live in Honolulu. And it, Kailua is right across. Anyway, got right through to him. He actually picks up the phone. <laughs> he didn't have a lot of business in those days. He was a very young guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you too. <laughs> so he said, I told him, I'd just been diagnosed with breast cancer. And he said, get your medical records. I want to talk to you. So you can imagine how quickly I got those records. And I'm sitting in his office. And this is when I get the news. It's your diet. And I mm -hmm. said, oh, no, no, not in my case. And you can imagine how fervently I was saying, no, no. I'm an expert in nutrition because I've had collagen. Anyway, uh, he tries to explain to me. And I said, well, it's the dairy. And of course, T. Colin Campbell hadn't written his book yet on the China study showing casein is an on-off switch on cancer. So we didn't know that yet either. In any case, he's, 
knew that I needed some convincing because I, I spoke like I was fairly well educated and things. So reached around, pulled up the file drawer, said, here are the studies on epidemiology that shows the country that eat the most animal products have the highest rates of breast cancer and conversely, in perfect correlation co coefficients. And here are the animal studies that have been done. So after two hours, literally, he spent two hours with me explaining all this, I walked out of his office with new hope, vegan, because never again was I going to touch any animal products. But then I went home <laughs> and told my husband all this. And his words were, oh, that's <laughs> yes. He said, I can't believe an intelligent woman like you falling for this crap. That's ridiculous. And it's, so I thought, well, I'm going to have to do this by myself. So mm -hmm. I did. Uh, in fact, in our refrigerator, you could see all his food, the lobster, the butter, the steaks, the foods we used to always have together. And then mm -hmm. my side, the leafy greens and fruits and vegetables. You know, a clear demarcation. <laughs> and I tried cooking for him and he, he said, oh, these pancakes taste like lead sinkers. And he shoved the plate away. Things were obviously going downhill in our relationship. And I, uh, so I, I got so much support from Dr. McDougall. Really, mm -hmm. I, I went back and forth. And when I got to oncology, uh, they said diet has nothing to do with breast cancer. And, and he, my husband had come with me on some of these visits and he said, driving home and saying, see, I told you, diet has nothing to do with this. And I was convinced and I tried to convince him it didn't work. So I kept right on running because I found that this was the way to relieve my anxiety. In fact, that next run that I did, I, I saw everything with new eyes. The colors popped, the, the feelings of gratitude that I am alive, I've got new answers, I know now what caused it and what to do about it. And I thought, I've got to tell everybody. <laughs> you know how mm -hmm. far I got with that? <laughs> you know? Most everybody reacted so similarly to what right. my then husband did. But the more I got into it, oh, the, 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 they did the follow-up testing, of course, and that's where they found the tumor in my lung. My liver enzymes were in the four digits way off the charts and the bone, the hot spots in my bones. So you have METs to the breast, not from, so from the breast you had but METs or metastasis to yeah. the lung, the liver and your bone. Right. And wow. they, the, the ones that were easiest to follow were the blood tests. So three weeks later, the liver enzymes had normalized. The hot spots in my bones were starting to fade. The bone pain, oh, I forgot to mention that. Uh, the bone pain in the middle of the night, even with opioids, was still so severe. I would walk and pace and think, what's going on with my bones? Well, that started fading right away, within days. That's how quickly a diet change can manifest itself. It was just incredible. Wow. Um, in my first book, A Race for Life, I talk about all this and, and how <laughs> there are lots of misadventures. I did a, an ultra marathon, a 32 uh, mile race, crossed the finish line and almost collapsed. Wow. And the next morning I had bloody stools, melana, and I called the ER at Tripler. <laughs> and they said, get in here right now. Right. I had GI bleeding. And uh, they, they knew me at Tripler because I was this patient stage four with no chemo, no radiation, just diet change. And so they said, see, I told you, it's, it's your diet. Right. I called Dr. McDougall right then and I told him where I was and they had done an NG tube down, I blood in the stomach. And he, he, I said, uh, they think it's the diet. He said, no, it's not the diet. He said, I don't know what, you aren't on any medications. I said, oh, yes, I am. I'm on naprosyn, you know, Aleve. Mm, yeah. The therapeutic dose for my 
arthritis. He said, oh my God, you've got it, GI bleeding from the naprosyn. He said, stop that right away. And I said, oh, what about my arthritis? He said, that's gonna be gone. So that was the second thing. First, the breast cancer recedes, then the arthritis uh, recedes. Constipation, oh, people ask me all, often, what was the first sign uh, that the diet was doing any good? And I said, right. the next morning. And they said, what? I said, yep, I had been constipated all my life and never knew it. In wow. fact, I had been told that three or four times a week is normal for some people. Well, normal for me meant that age 23, I had a fissure, an anal fissure so severe, they took me into surgery to sew it up. I, wow. That was how hard it was for me to have bowel movements. And so finding out, you know, from age 23 to 47, this is the answer to constipation. Why didn't somebody tell me, like the proctologist, <laughs> who right. saw the surgery as the answer instead of diet. So that was the other thing. Constipation went away. And wow. having what I call the perfect poop is such a joy. Really, <laughs> it, it's uh, really helpful <laughs> if we started off right. Uh, what else? My adult acne. Yeah. I was put on tetracycline for, in the 40s having all this acne. Dr. McDougall said, stop that, that's gonna go away. Mm -hmm. How many, but the dense breast, the other breast, you know, all those symptoms. I was also starting into perimenopause. I just slid through menopause, not a single hot flash, no other emotional other than what I went through with the sure. surgery, all the crying bouts and woe is me and what am I gonna do now? Um, there were no menopausal symptoms whatsoever, still to this day. I mean, <laughs> of course, wow. wait past that. But there's, uh, gosh, what else? There were just, it was kind of like, you name it, I had it, and it's gone. Wow. So I'm so convinced. Well, I hadn't gone back to work yet, and I'm uh, watching television, which I never had time to do before, because my job, the Air Force, you know how demanding a job can be. Your life is theirs. You get called two in the clock in the morning for an exercise. <laughs> Having, go. yes, being active duty, yeah. you, you've oh. written off your soul for the amount of time that you've signed oh. up. <laughs> I, that was me as being a logistics officer. Mm. So I watched television and I was just going through and I see this ABC Wide World of Sports. And it's the Ironman Triathlon. And it started right here in Hawaii. In fact, actually on Oahu, because the, the swim was the Waikiki Rough Water Swim, which is, I'm pointing just down the road there. The bike portion, and it's 2.4 miles in that race, and all the swimmers do that. And there's the Round the Island Oahu bike race, 112 miles, so all the cyclists wow. do that. And there's the Honolulu Marathon. The runners do that, which I had done a bunch of times. And th this was started in 1979. One each of the sports got together and they argued about who was the fittest of the three. It was, it was four or five guys. And they said, there's only one way to prove it. We do all three at the same time on the same day. So <laughs> that's how the Iron Man started. Well, in 82, it had been going three years. It started with 15 people and it got to 30 and then 40. And so it was brand new. Nobody else had heard of it, really. Back, in fact, still, some people haven't heard of it. And I thought, oh, I can do the marathon. I know how to swim. Anybody can sit on a bike and pedal. And with this diet, I'm going to prove that it's not only good for cancer, but it's good for athletes, too. So Valerie Silk was a race director. Her office was right down the street here. So I went to her office and I told her what I wanted to do. It'd be the first cancer patient to do the Iron Man and the first vegan. Now Dave hmm. Scott was vegetarian and he had won a bunch of first place overall vegetarian, but he was so strict about that. He rinsed off his cottage cheese dairy and he thought fish was, you know, not really a bit of uh, meat. You know? mm -hmm. uh, 
So I really was the first vegan to do it. So oh. I did get a little publicity, like the local paper, the same one that had the announcement of Dr. McDougall's notice, put me on the cover, front page, uh, finishing the Ironman triathlon. And so Dr. I showed it to Dr. McDougall and he, he, he didn't really think exercise that extreme was good for you. You know, he has a point, it is pretty extreme, but I kind of reveled in it. And uh, so I had done so well that he said, you've got to write a book. Hmm. Like me, write a book? Who's going to read anything I write? I'm just a nobody. And he said, listen, I try to tell women to change their diet and they don't listen. They might listen to you. So I said, oh, okay, all right, I'll do it. And, but I was so busy training and still working and, and trying to get my life back together. And he checked up on me and said, have you started that book yet? I said, oh, uh, no. <laughs> he said, listen, with this new word program, it is so easy. He said, meet me at this computer store and I'll show you how to get started. That's how much interest he took in, in wow. how to get started with a race for life. And I love that title because it was a race for life at so many levels. I'm going to race the rest of my life. I'm racing for life, energy, and excitement, and this is living. And it's going to save my life because I still believe exercise is important. Mm -hmm. But he told me that it's number two, that right. diet trumps everything. So, uh, and so I started getting more publicity. In fact, Continental Airlines came up to me after my third Ironman and said, you know, they have an Ironman in New Zealand. Would you like us to send you to New Zealand as a sponsored athlete? And I said, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> they outfitted me with Continental down my side here and I wore the clothes and they paid for everything. The free airfare, first class, flying wow. down. <laughs> and so I did the Ironman there. The next morning I wanted to see the, uh, the newspaper results because I'd gotten the first place in my age group. Wow. And uh, walked into this convenience store and I see the pile of newspapers and there's my picture. It literally, oh, I should have had it handy. Literally this big front page of me on the finish. And it says, Ruth, a woman of iron in two inch caps across the top. <laughs> I was blown away. <laughs> I mean, there's one newspaper in New Zealand, the, the New Zealand Herald. And everybody in the country knew who I was. Uh, it's a small country and Anyway, everywhere I went, they said, oh, you're the one. Oh, how fun. I took that back to the, the Continental Airline office here, laid it on his desk, and he looks down at that, and he says, don't they have an Iron Man in Japan? <laughs> and I said, yeah. He said, why don't we send you to do that one, too? <laughs> well, I was in the in October. This was March for <laughs> New Zealand, and the Japan was in August. And wow. I was can I do three Ironmans in, a, in less than a year? And I think, what am I going to do if I don't finish? Fire me? So I told Dennis, I'll do it. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, same thing happened. Uh, first wow. place, newspaper coverage, except this time it's in Japanese. <laughs> but I have my picture. <laughs> and so, <laughs> anyway, uh -huh. but, uh, Wow. I started getting invited to give talks. And so I, the more I, I taught, learned about it, the more experience I could relay to people. This wow. really works. And still there is resistance, which is kind of too bad. But I kept trying to, well, you show by example. Right. And, so, and Martin Rowe is the editor of, of, of my books. Uh, he's in New York City and he was vegan, which is why they picked up A Race for Life. He was not a runner. So after mm -hmm. editing my book, he thought, huh, I'm going to try running. Well, he's run five New York City marathons. Run, in fact, he ran Boston the year that they had the Boston bombing. Oh, wow. Where he had crossed the finish line in advance, so he was okay. But anyway, he, I get a call from him one day, and he said, you know, I just figured out, you've just turned 70. You're still doing triathlons. We need you to write a book on senior fitness. Hmm. I'm thinking, yeah, because it's not just breast cancer. 
heart disease kills many more women than breast cancer. Mm -hmm. In fact, all the cancers combined. And right. we know how to reverse heart disease right. by diet. So, and then I thought, diabetes, obesity, hypertension. Okay, Martin, you're, you're on. I'm going to write senior fitness. So uh, that was the second book. And the third book is my recipe book because people ask, well, what were you eating before, during, and after? And I said, well, the, the standard American diet, except that I, I thought I was eating low fat because mm -hmm. it was lean chicken. I took the skin off the chicken thinking that was good enough with powdered milk on my cereal and uh, any way I could cut out fat, trim off the fat of the steak, you know, and the mm -hmm. pork Right. Thinking that was good enough. Well, I found out that was far from good enough. It was, that was what was giving me cancer and all these other symptoms. I was also borderline hypertension, forgot to mention that. Mm. And of course now it runs 90 over 60. I've had a doctor say, that's too low. How can it be too low when your arteries are wide open? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and your heart efficiency is so mm -hmm. efficient that it it it's only ninety beats a minute to get it. Anyway, um, so uh, there was just so many other advantages that eating this way, I immediately had more energy, recovery. That was what allowed me to do an Ironman one day. The next day not be sore, go out and do a short run swim, whereas all the other athletes, including <laughs> the winners of the other age groups, were so mm -hmm. sore, they had to go up and down stairs backwards, and they'd see me wow. swimming and running. What? <laughs> You're not sore? You're not tired? I said, no, it's my diet. <laughs> Did so going back to what you were eating, so you were given this diagnosis, you met Dr. McDougall, and then what did you go to eating directly? Did you eat all raw? Did you eat cooked no. foods as well? How, how did you proceed? I, he had uh, the, his recipe book. In fact, it's right over there on my bookshelf, a little loose leaf thing, and it had all the recipes and the, the logic behind the, the diet, which is, is starch based. So you can eat all the oatmeal in the morning you want. So I would have this large bowl of oatmeal and lots of fruit on it and apple juice at the time. I soon gave up apple juice because you don't need it with lots of juicy fruits. And then for lunch, it would be a baked potato, which is always handy. You bake a whole bunch of potatoes at a time, wrap them in foil. So when I'd go out for a long run or a long bike, I would have them in my backpack and I could eat uh, while I was out. And of course, broccoli. I knew the leafy greens were really important. So I had lots of leafy greens. And while I wasn't particularly fond of them before, when I found my taste buds changed and, mm. and gradually I realized I love kale. <laughs> you know, it's one of my favorite foods. Added watercress. We have a watercress farm not too far from here. Mm. So I get fresh watercress and add that. Started a uh, little side story. In 1988, I was invited to the Olympics in Seoul, the big Olympics to, as a, a ambassador uh, for Americans and support oh. athletes there. And I got to eat in the same venues that all the athletes ate. And they had their sections, the Japanese section here, Chinese here, Russian there, uh, European and Americans, McDonald type food, of course. And you know, I wasn't about to eat there. So I was exploring the others. What I noticed for breakfast, the non-American athletes were eating fruits and veggies, and the, the Japanese, the miso, and, and their greens there. And I, that's when I got the idea to add kale to my oatmeal. So I hmm. always have greens with my oats in the morning. So I get greens three times a day, two actually, I have two big meals now these days. So it was um, anything that is plant-based, uh, it's raw uh, as much as possible, only because it's easier. My mm. the third book, Chef, is my acronym: cheap, healthy, easy, and fast. Mm. Because I don't want to spend a lot of time in the kitchen. 
and this is an objection I hear from people. Oh, it takes so much time. No, it does. It doesn't have to. Mm -hmm. Right. This book is so simple, easy, and, and you don't make fancy dishes. I say in there that variety, if you get tired of something or you're always craving, having these cravings of, of, of the foods, it's your brain, the committee in the brain saying, you're not feeding us right. You need to get more whatever. And most people haven't figured it out yet. Once mm -hmm. you figure it out, the cravings go away, your taste buds change, and you love the fruits and vegetables and legumes and whole grains. They are the most tasty foods. And so I eat basically the same thing every day. It's so, okay. so fast, but it's a large quantity. I eat a lot. In fact, people are always saying, you're going to eat all that? <laughs> <laughs> and I am full. I mean, I just finished my big breakfast here in Hawaii where uh, I've had my early morning workout. And so I had breakfast and I, I'm nice and full. I'm satiated. So nice. you're going vegan and trying a lot raw and you're still hungry, eat more. Mm -hmm. and the answer, you get to satisfy your appetite. It's just, I just can't rave enough about how... <laughs> how it meets every single need we have, the physical, mm -hmm. the emotional, the psychological. Um, oh, people said, uh, well, you're, you must have had a, a lot of anxiety or did you have to see a psychiatrist to handle the anxiety and, and you're, you need a positive attitude. My philosophy is a positive attitude is the end result of being healthy. It's not something you adopt. Mm -hmm. It happens. You, when you feel this good, this healthy, this energetic, that is a positive attitude. Right, <laughs> you know? absolutely. Yeah, and any health concerns you have, well, I'm not sure about aging. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I've got some wrinkles here. <laughs> and um, uh, let me see, what are the effects of aging? Well, how, tell us what your exercise regimen is currently. You said you exercise this morning. Like, are you still running every day? Yeah, it's uh, gotten, oh, slow down, <laughs> slowing down. That's the aging effect. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm going just as fast, but uh, I'm not. Uh, I look at the, what? <laughs> a mile. I used to do a five minute mile. <laughs> wow. You said, what's your mile now? You said? <laughs> forgot to tell not to tell you 15 minutes oh that you know what though i mean anybody i'm excited when an 83 year old can walk from their bathroom to their bed you know what i mean so so you're running every single day and what other exercises do you do short runs in fact it's get it's getting to be more walking because the knees are starting to give me problems yeah. Uh, then I, I do a swim and a bike and weights. I have a, my own universal gym right out here on the lanai, as you can almost see. And so I, I have a pec deck and the lat pull down bars and uh, reverse leg curls and oh, the ab vest to do the crunches. So I do those okay. three times a week. Wow. I do yoga for stretching. Uh, we have a pool here. So I do a bunch of laps every day. Nice. That's my daily shower afterwards. Hmm. A, a tip, laundry tip. I don't have to do much washing of clothes because the clothes, the shorts and the top that I wear to run and bike in is what I swim in. I go okay. my ass on. You don't change clothes. You wear the same thing <laughs> throughout the whole. So I swim in these and I, and I get out of the shower. They're clean. <laughs> so, <laughs> so all these little tips here that I've learned. Um, so yeah, run bike. I have a stationary bike out here on my lanai. It's, okay. I've given up road biking to train because I've been hit twice. Oh wow! Tibial rod in my left leg. Oh my wow! Was fractured in three places, and when they got me to the ER, they told me had I not been as fit as I was, I they think I would have been killed because the damage was so extensive. That was 1998, so 20 years ago. And they said, you'll never run again because they thought that with the hip uh, and the acetabulum was broken, fractured. 
and they said you might as well face up to it uh you'll never you'll be lucky to walk with all this damage on both multi fact multifocal fractures is the medical term they they gave mm -hmm. me actually both sides and that's why i got the tibial rod because um if you if we don't let us put that rod in your leg, you aren't going to be able to do any weight bearing for six to eight weeks. And I knew how devastating that would be. No weight bearing. Hmm. So, um, in fact, I consulted with Dr. McDougall, Dr. Clapper, Dr. Harris, and uh, what do I do? And so we we went with the tibial rod. And then when I got out of the hospital three weeks later, I said, "Get me in the pool." So I started water running, no, mm. you know, deep end, and then gradually started touching a little bit in the shallow end, and then shallower and shallower, and pretty soon tried on the land, and so I got back to running. Wow. And I was the medical coverage was physical therapy, PT three times a week. I went six times a week, paid for the other three myself. So I had intensive physical therapy. I was that determined to get back into running triathlon shape wow. so that uh those those little anecdotes are in in my books too <laughs> so um the next one was um let me see we got C senior fitness race for life chef and lifelong oh yeah martin Rowe, the editor uh i get another call from him and he said you know i just figured out you've been running for almost 50 years you know, starting in 68, and he loved it so much. He said, we need you to write a book on running. <laughs> how many myths, you know? Do you remember they used to say women shouldn't run because their uterus would fall out? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Believe that. It was, and actually, it keeps the pelvic floor strong because you're exercising all these muscles. So right. uh, that was my fourth book, Lifelong Running, with a whole bunch of these anecdotes, like I was running in, in Korea, one of the bases there and running along this korean soldier comes running along he says i want bad bread and i'm sorry i don't speak korean i want be print 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 oh friend friend yes oh. yes <laughs> so he ran with me <laughs> we ran oh. around the 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 uh, the field the runway of the air force base there so lots of fun oh one time i was giving a briefing to uh a four-star general. Um, it was on logistics. We back then we were uh, shipping F-16s to Iran back when they were mm. our friends, <laughs> and I was supposed to give a briefing there. And this general wanted to hear my briefing first. He didn't know it was a female. <laughs> March him into the briefing room, and I'm standing on the side. And the, the, the colonel accompanying the general turns to me and says, "Could you get?" the general a cup of coffee please and <laughs> look oh can you get the general a cup of coffee please and i march up on the stage <laughs> their mouths dropped you know <laughs> what this woman giving this briefing so that was wow. one of my, one of my <laughs> crowning moments so. <laughs> <laughs> So, that's hilarious yeah. oh yeah absolutely um we can definitely talk about that but i'm curious did your husband ever get on board with you with your diet when he saw that you're you had recovery from your cancer closed mind you know some people oh. just couldn't do it on my website which is ruthheidrick.com mm -hmm. which we'll put a link to yep um there's the Ask Dr. Ruth. And this is primarily because women with breast cancer are getting on the internet and looking for things. And my story pops up. So I get to answer these questions about breast cancer from women literally all over the world, from Hungary, from Norway, to Portugal, to uh, not Russia yet, I think. <laughs> anyway, all over. And sometimes they confuse me with the other Dr. Ruth, you know, the sex therapist. And so I get these questions about, oh, <laughs> oh, I mean, some of them, are, anyway, <laughs> I realize that, and I tell them, I think you meant this for the other Dr. Ruth. However, if you would change your diet, your ED would disappear. 
because it's the clogging of that critical artery, which is so tiny, it's the size of a head of a pin, the tiniest bit of meat and dairy will clog that artery and that's, try that. And so I got enough of these, I thought, oh, I gotta write one more book. So this is the only book that Martin didn't ask me to write. <laughs> and so I'm gonna broaden it, how to prevent, reverse, and cure erectile dysfunction. It, <laughs> and it works for women. You know, women have the same basic anatomy in slightly different format, mm -hmm. but the functions are pretty much the same. And so I discovered that, wow, there that's another great effect. <laughs> that, that if people knew that alone, don't you think that would get more people changing their diet? Mm -hmm. Macho, Especially men. Meat eating men to change their diet because if they're finding that uh, they're the half staff flag, you know, forks over knives, yes, <laughs> Jen talks about the flag at half mast, yes, uh, that, that. <laughs> and actually, I wrote an article of the new uh, the plant based Viagra, but they censored that out. <laughs> <laughs> But it's becoming more open now. People are recognizing that we can talk about this. That right. It's important. It's an important part of all of our lives. In fact, in that my ED book, I have a quote, a section from United Nations, the World Health Organization, that says that this is an important part of everybody's life. Mm. So that's my <laughs> fifth book. Okay. So. I'm sure there's more books in you somewhere. <laughs> yeah, the four great lessons that everybody needs to learn. That that's my, the one I'm working on an outline right now. Is the which which what lessons? Four great life lessons. Oh, can you share what those lessons are? Or do um, you rather wait? Well, no, diet and exercise is the first two. Very obvious. Okay. And the third is microbiology. Um, mm. the, I remember in uh, what middle school uh, when we'd all go to the the bathroom uh, if we washed our hands at all it was just a, a simple running under the water you know and that was it and half the time we never bothered at all I now know how important that course I took in microbiology taught me so much about the good bugs the bad bugs and what it takes even if you have surgery and under the most sterile techniques, you can still have contamination. We know that bacteria can, is, is devastating. So people, if everybody had a course in microbiology, wouldn't it make your life a lot easier? <laughs> yes, if they could understand that, you know, antibiotics don't cure viral infections and that antibiotics kill off your microbiome, which is a good part of your gut. So yeah, absolutely. <laughs> make my life a lot easier <laughs> um I, go ahead that's pretty much i think all i wanted to say oh i've and got I, more I, questions and had uh. a whole bunch and uh, i'm so grateful to dr mcdool for what i learned from him uh. and listen to him uh, he convinced me he's, as he's convinced a lot of other people too Abs you know, absolutely. And I, I was blessed to interview Dr. McDougall. He's a crack up. He's, you know, you had to be quite the pioneer spirit to take on the conventional wisdom of medicine and say, you know, I think we're missing a big part here and let's focus on eating foods that will actually heal you. And it took a long time, but there is a growing movement. There's more physicians like myself and some others who are really taking hold of that and, you know, supporting them and Kind of, you know, I, I like to say we're standing on the shoulders of giants, like Dr. McDougall included, and Dr. Esselstyn, and Dr. Yeah. Campbell, all those amazing individuals. Um, With his nutritionfacts.org. Yes, Gregor is more my age, so he's uh, kind of in that next generation. <laughs> um, I do have a question for you about all of these races. So you have over 900 plus. It's 12 o'clock. Yeah. Oh, it's 12, it says it's 12 o'clock. Okay, so something said it was 12 o'clock. But um, there was something about uh, 900 plus of those races. So what is your what was your favorite race of all of those in the last however many decades that you've been running, close to 50 years? How 
what what is some of those moments that really stand out to you i just remembered the senior olympics hmm. uh, when i heard about the senior olympics um i thought oh i have uh in chicken soup for the soul you know they have all these i've got four of my stories in there and one of them is called uh, olympic dreams mm -hmm. uh, as a swimmer here in hawaii um i had ideas of, of the swimming olympics esther williams you've probably never heard of her she was a movie star who was a swimmer and she did all these bathing beauty movies and so i wanted to be like her and thought i'm going to uh, swim so fast i'm going to be in the olympics well i got into college and forget that because i had enough on my hands i had to work my way through college no no parental help at all and so those olympic dreams went away so when i heard about the senior olympics i thought ah oh, i can still do the olympics so um i got the state level won the first place there in the, the running the 10k uh, the track and field and the triathlon when, and the senior olympics that year was held in las vegas so i signed up for that and as you know national all the states send all their senior olympic competitors well as it turned out i was the only one from hawaii wow at the at the end you do the parade through the, the track in the stadium the thousands of people there at the end of the olympics i'd gotten three medals in fact there's a newspaper article right over there that i clip hydric goes on Olymp on uh, olympic gold medal tear <laughs> <You know? laughs> and as they lined up all the states they start with alaska and alabama arkansas and then all the way down to what's the last state, Wisconsin, whatever. And I'm looking and it, it's a whole bunch of people. And I'm looking, where's Hawaii? Where's Hawaii? And it goes from <laughs> something to something and Hawaii's, where's Hawaii? And so I go to the desk, well, you're the only one from Hawaii. So I get to walk into the stadium holding this big, big placard, Hawaii. <laughs> and so that got the greatest cheer <laughs> because of this one woman <laughs> and Aww. all these cameras were there and I was crying. I had tears and, and I could hardly, I was sobbing. Uh, uh, what a fantastic moment that was. It's just incredible to be National Olympics and, and the standing ovation. So wow. that was my favorite. Uh, oh, let me see. I got this one picture right here this is in oh. between uh the same day i had just finished the triathlon and picked up my number for the track and field oh wow they caught that, that one and i was oh on fire i mean it was such a fantastic cool. event so that's my favorite one what year was that 1997 the year before that truck did me oh, in oh wow yeah. wow in fact, I, the next year, 98, I was going to do the uh, Australian Ironman. That mm -hmm. was my plan, of course. And I was also uh, turning 64, and I was planning on doing as many races as I was old. Mm -hmm. the, 62, I had done 62 races. I did as many as three races in one weekend. Oh <laughs> so you were doing that many races per year? Yeah. Yep. Oh my gosh. Every weekend, at least one race. In fact, one time I did a 5K here. It started at 7 o'clock, and the triathlon on the other side of the island started at 8. I did the 5K, finished in 20 minutes, got in the car, drove to the other side, had told the race director, if I'm not there, can you <laughs> wait until I get there? And she said, sure. Mm -hmm. I got there in plenty of time because I had 40 minutes to get there and get my bike all ready to go. And I'd gotten two gold medals, two races the same day. And that was in the newspaper, the race results next to each other. And you see Ruth Heydrich first place, Ruth Heydrich first place, same day. And wow. I get a call from the editor of the newspaper. And he said, I can't believe what I'm just reading. How did you do that? <laughs> so <laughs> so <laughs> what was your fastest 5K? What was your typical uh, time? 20 minutes. Uh, wow. Yeah. You were very fast. 
for a while, yeah. <laughs> Goodness. And the, it, oh, I was racing before the cancer, but I was never first place, never in the front. Wow. Always in the middle of the pack. And that, oh, from the last marathon before the cancer and the diet changed to after, I took 17 minutes off that marathon time. And this was with surgeries in between and all the anxiety. Um, I kept running because that kept my sanity. That's what allowed me to sleep at night and be thankful for what I did have and that the loss of, of breast was nothing. I mean, that was... Uh, so my- was it the accident that slowed you down? I mean, it sounds like you were a force to be reckoned with. And then the accident, did you do any more triathlons after the accident? I did. Uh, okay. But I got more nervous about the bike. Mm. I've had two friends killed wow. by hit while biking. Yeah, mm. two of them. And it's just too dangerous. And Dr. Harris told me in the hospital, he said, biking is not your friend. And I see it's on the roads every day. I see cyclists not wearing helmets, um, taking chances until we become more bike friendly like Amsterdam. Right. I've been, everybody rides bikes. Copenhagen, they ride bikes. Right. That, so. Until they're more bike, bike dedicated bike paths and roads. Yeah. yeah. My and husband likes to do biking. Makes me nervous. Yeah, it does. So. Uh, that was another reason for doing less and, and for the, the stationary bike. That's, that's my training. Gotcha. And then what was your fastest um, triathlon time? Oh, for the Ironman? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it was uh, 13 hours. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> um, so let's recap for people who don't understand. That is a, how it's a, it's a how far is your swim to something? 2.4 miles. 2.4 miles swimming and then a 112 mile bike. In the ocean. <laughs> in the ocean. Seasick. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And with a crowd of swimmers kicking and like literally. Yeah, goggles off. <laughs> Jeez. And then you did a 100. That's 112 great. mile bike. 112 mile bike and then a full marathon, 26.2 miles. And the, there's a cutoff on each of these. Two hours, 15 minutes for the swim. If you don't make it, you're out. Eight hours for the bike. Uh, again, if you're, they do have sag wagons because flat tires and, and broken derailers are a fact of life. They help mm-hmm. you get back on. And then uh, if you don't make it in by midnight, you're, you're out. Wow. So, Incredible. Yeah. And... Do you, um, wait, 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 wait. This is one of the, oh, finish. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So incredible. Yeah. So, so what, what, what type of advice do you have for someone who's, let's say in their middle age years, you I mean, here you are, you know, the, you're quite the, the shining example of what someone in their elder years can be um, as far as health and everything. But let's say someone who's in their late 40s, 50s, 60s, and they're overweight and they're, you know, they're struggling with chronic disease. What is your advice for someone like that to get started? Um, let me be smart assy. Read my books. <laughs> <laughs> Well, All right, I can I, do that. I can tell people what to do. And and it's like when I hear something, it needs to be reinforced. Right. Because for so many people, it's such a radical change. It's hard to imagine like giving up cheese or mm-hmm. oils. I thought olive oil was good for me. I read right. just this morning, olive oil is a full of antioxidants and it's healthy for you. Oh gosh. Mm -hmm. So you need reinforcement. So you got to hear the message. You've got to have it reinforced. And there's not a lot of reinforcement around us. Mm -hmm. We are still swimming upstream alone in many, many cases, most families, um, my own kids. It's hard for me to uh, (laughs) convince them that 
they ought to give up all their meat and dairy. So wait, you have kids. They saw you f- literally come back from the brink of a stage four breast cancer diagnosis, and they didn't feel inspired to make those changes? And they think their mom's a uh, kook and crazy, and um, I don't know. It's a sore subject for me. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Really- in fact, my son, I probably shouldn't be saying this. I got him to send him a copy of the DVD, Forks Over Knives. I said, watch this. Yeah. And I don't think he even finished it because he said, oh, it's scare tactics. Oh. It's not scare tactics. But How many children do you have? Two. Two. Okay. My, my children are 64 and 62. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Mine are... Too, yeah. Oh, your grandma of how many? Great grandma. Oh, great grandma. I just oh. had my third great grandchild, January 19th. Oh, well, congratulations. Mm-hmm. Are they close? No, I mean, my kids were raised in Hawaii, went to college on the mainland. Uh, my daughter went to Arizona State along with her boyfriend from high school here. They got married when they both graduated. Mm. And he was an ROTC, and he retired as a full colonel and then came back in the senior executive service, and and they finally just retired in Florida. (laughs) About as far as you ways you can get. (laughs) This was primarily because my grandson, their son, was in the Navy for two years and met a woman in Jacksonville, Florida, Mm. got married, and so... My daughter's granddaughter's kids are in Jacksonville. They wanted to be near them. Sure. (laughs) That's why they went there. Uh, When I was at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Mm -hmm. uh, where my son went to high school there, uh, met uh, his future wife there. Oh, wow. uh, Actually went to college or got, yeah. He graduated from high school in Ohio went to Ohio State, got a degree in engineering, and and settled back in Ohio, right outside of work, right pat as a GS-13, similar to my career. I see. Wow. So have you ever thought of moving to the mainland to be closer to family? (sighs) That's a hard one. Yeah, I imagine. Weather they're having right now. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and the yeah. Heat, heat and humidity in Florida. Uh, oh, we oh, were yeah. in Alabama, at Montgomery Air Force Base for a few years. Mm-hmm. And, uh, the Air War College. Oh. And heat and humidity is just horrible. And the bugs. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I did training there before I was active duty. I did training in Alabama. And no offense to my Southeast audience, but... It's a miserable experience in August, marching and training. And, and then we were stationed, my husband was stationed at Wright Pat, so out in Dayton. Oh. <laughs> so I'm very familiar with all those places. I was stationed at Langley in Virginia. It was still hot and muggy. So yeah, we lived at 17A Egan Avenue. Oh, wow. You remember the address. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. So let's recoup here. You've got Dr. Ruth Heydrich at dot com which i'll put a link everywhere and look at the show notes you also have five books uh race for life from cancer to iron man senior fitness the chef c-h-e-f acronym book it's all about what you were eating and then lifelong running and then you have um how to overcome 11 myths of running and live a healthier life and then my favorite Cure, reverse, and prevent ED. Ten ways to have total sexual fitness. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. It's so awesome. Oh, my goodness. That's fabulous. The old people, they're, they're downhill in, in everything. Right. As explicit as I'll get right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know how to say thank you enough because I just think you're a delight. <laughs> just adorable. Oh my goodness. Thank you for the opportunity. And I get to meet you when you come. Yes. 
And thank you for inviting me. I'm uh, going to be speaking at the VegFest there in November. And so I get to meet you in person and see more of. I've been to Hawaii a couple of times. My husband was born in Hawaii. And um, oh, really? oh. yeah, so but he was in his uh, dad was Navy. He's Filipino. And um, so we've been back twice. And I love Hawaii. So okay, amazing so place. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I get it. I, I personally love the outdoors and, but, uh, we're going to be settling in Colorado by the summertime. That's where my kids are, or most of them anyway. So they're all in their twenties. There is hope for these younger people. All my kids eat plants. <laughs> Got to them early enough. See, mine were long gone. Yeah. They were 13, 15 and 18. And now they're, one's almost 25, 22 and 20. So yeah, we were lucky. My husband's on board a hundred percent as well. So oh, nice. yeah. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm pretty stubborn. So I was like, there ain't no be no animal products in this house. I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> but he never went grocery shopping. So I was like, eh, okay, whatever. <laughs> Not worth the fight. <laughs> oh, bless your heart. Okay. Boy, Ruth, I can't wait to have everyone share this um, interview, and I hope that um, it just inspires others on the other half of this life. You know, I'm kind of, as I'm, I'm going to be 50 next year, and as I enter into the second half of life, I feel like that's a demarcation, right? That half century point, and I'm like, I still feel pretty good. I'm kind of, you know, but it is, like you said, you know, you're like, wow. You sail through menopause, you have lots of energy. And, yeah, you know, yeah. Margaret, right. the, 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 what did she call it? The menopause surge or something uh, where you, you, it's like a new lease on life, a new section of your life where you get to be more outspoken and right. do things you never had a chance to do when you were younger. So Right, you know, yeah, because we were a great young. Time. 50s were some of the best years. Well, that's fantastic because I'm entering into that phase and I'm thinking, wow, you know, because we, we started early, 23, 25, 27 is when I had babies. And then I went to medical school when they were little, they were five, three and 10 months when I started medical school. And then I went to the Air Force and then oh, there's just so much going on. But yeah, it's kind of like now it's like, wow, what do we do with all this extra time? <laughs> I filled it up with a lot of things, a lot of work. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Well, thank you again, Miss Ruth. And everyone, thank you for listening. And please check out her website. Again, it's all in the show notes. And we so appreciate you taking your time for us today. Thank you. Okay, one sec here.